We have been in this amazing series called Change the World. I've said it four times today, so I hope you know we're in the middle of Change the World. And I wanted to do something a little different with the intro. I just wanted to share with you personally what I feel like Change the World has been doing in my life. I really feel like it's returned to me the joy of my salvation. Anybody else feel like that? I really feel like it's ignited my passion in me again to talk to people about Jesus, to have conversations with them. You remember when you first get saved? You tell everybody. Like, you just walking by somebody on the side of the road and be like, hey, do you know Jesus? Do you believe in Jesus? Hey, are you saved? Hey, can I pray for you? And at some point I got to this this place where I just kind of got complacent. And so this series has really just like ignited a flame in me again to be able to share the gospel with people and to talk to people. I hope that it's done the same for you. And so if you've been following along with us, this comes out of the passage of John 4. And it's this story about Jesus and the woman at the well. And I'm going to paraphrase it because we've been talking about it. If you want to catch up, check out the latest messages. But there's this whole story where Jesus meets this woman at the well. And he has a conversation with her. But after her conversation with him, she goes back into the town and she says, come and see. I've met the Savior of the world. She was one of the first evangelists that Jesus used. And the whole town comes and they get saved. It's an incredible story. But there's a part that I specifically want to look at today. And so we're going to pick up in John 4, verses 16 through 18. And Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying you have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. I love how blunt Jesus is sometimes. But this story is so significant to me because anybody grow up in a small town or semi-large town? Did anybody grow up in a town at all? Nobody's raising their hands. Online, if you grew up in a small town, just wave at me. But you know how small towns are kind of small towns? I feel like everybody knows everybody's story. Or somebody knows something about somebody else, and if you ask, they could probably tell you about it. You know what I'm talking about? If Jesus knew this lady's story, I know it was from the gift of knowledge by the Holy Spirit, but I bet you people in her town knew who she was. I bet you when people are like, oh, there go that lady. Mm-hmm. Was that her fourth husband? Mm-hmm. Or has it been two weeks since the last husband? I bet you people knew about her. And I bet you when they saw her around town, they probably had some comments. They probably had some opinions about her. Maybe even not even knowing her backstory, but they had comments or opinions about her. I wonder how this made her feel. I wonder if she ever walked around in her town ashamed. Wonder if she ever was wondering what people were thinking about her, what their opinions were of her. I wonder if it caused her to just feel shame, and maybe she thought about speaking up but wouldn't because somebody wouldn't take her seriously. You ever been in back in your hometown? My beautiful wife is here. What's up, babe? Love you. We went back to my hometown one time, and I'm literally praying the whole way there that we don't run anybody, run into anybody who knows Josh like before he really got saved. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because there's some stories about me (laughs) before I got saved. I know you're waiting to hear one today, but it's not going to happen, okay? So we'll save that for another time. But we ran into this person, and I'm like, oh, no. I'm like, please don't tell my wife the story that I know that you know, because if you say it, I'm going to be really embarrassed. But you know that feeling of, like, somebody knowing something that you've done in your past, and potentially there's a chance for you to be ashamed of that or feel shame in that. I wonder if that's how this woman felt. But then the story progresses and she's talking with Jesus and she has an encounter and she realizes he reveals to her that he's the savior of the world. And all of a sudden there's like a shift that happens. And so let's pick up in John 4, 28 through 30. It says, so the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of the town and they were coming to him. Now, this is where I know scripture is God breathed and he told us everything he wanted us to know in the Bible. But I kind of wish we had like Bible backstories. Anybody else feel like that? Like I wish I knew the whole story, not just the part that God wanted us to know. Because I wonder if when she went back into town and said, I've met a man, I wonder if people were like, I'm sure you've met a man. Mm -hmm. What's this man number eight, man number nine? How many men you going to meet? I wonder if people had comments. I wonder if people had opinions. 
I wonder if people tried to put her down as soon as she started to speak. And maybe before she met Jesus, that would have silenced her. Maybe before she met Jesus, that would have discouraged her. But this time she goes, no, no, no. I haven't just met a man. I've met the Savior of the world. And I don't care what you think about my past. You've got to come and see and meet this Jesus. Because look at this. Before, she was probably ashamed of who she was. But after one encounter with Jesus, she was no longer ashamed of who she was because she knew who he is. One encounter with Jesus will not leave you the same. It will leave you changed and unashamed. And so the title of today's message is Changed and Unashamed. That was just the intro. Y'all ready to go? Let's go. I'm feeling warmed up. <clears throat> so what does it mean to be unashamed? I love defining things anytime I, I preach. Pastor Ken says something. He's like, in order to fulfill it, you have to define it. I love that. So we're going to define what unashamed means. I also, this is just a side note for me. I can't stand when you look something up and the definition of it is just the opposite of what it is. So unashamed, the first definition is not ashamed. Duh. Confident, being without guilt, self-consciousness, or doubt. Now, some of you know this. Some of you don't. I don't ride roller coasters. And so I'm about to give you an example of what it is to be unashamed. I don't care what you guys think about me not riding roller coasters. I do not care. It has nothing to do with being afraid of them, which is what most people think. Oh, come on, man up, bro. Just get on the roller coaster. I am perfectly fine being a man standing on flat on my two feet right here. I, I, I don't mind drops. But it's the spinning and the flips. I'm like, Whoop. you know what I'm saying? And I don't like the feeling of being sick. And somebody tried to guilt trip me the other day. And they were like, well, what about your kids? What about when you have kids and they want to go on the roller coaster? This is why God brings you a helpmate. My wife loves roller coasters. So guess what? They can go with their mom, and I'm cool with it. I'm going to stand at the bottom, hold all the bags, wave at them, and take their picture as they go. You are not going to shame me into getting on a roller coaster. It ain't going to happen. <clears throat> That's all I got for that. But in order to really understand what unashamed is, there's a root word in here that I really want to talk about today, and it's shame. And the definition of shame is a painful emotion caused by guilt, shortcomings, mistakes, a condition of humiliating disgrace. Anybody ever felt shame before? I'm going to keep it a, a little lighthearted with this first story because we're going to go deep today. But <clears throat> I remember um, my dad got this brand new car. My dad and mom are here today. What's up, mom and dad? How y'all doing? Love y'all. Good to see y'all. My dad got this brand new car, and I'm going to make fun of him a little bit. You know how old people are with cars? They get excited about it. They got to name their car. They're so excited about their car. So this is Sporty. He's got a key of Sportage, and it's called Sporty. And I love Sporty. I'm not making fun of Sporty. It's a really nice SUV. It's got a panoramic sunroof. You know the whole deal. Dad, nice car, man. But I needed an SUV to be able to move stuff because I got a little bit of Kia Forte. <laughs> it's, it's tiny. So can I just say this first, though? If y'all ever borrow somebody else's stuff, please treat it better than you would treat your own stuff. Like if somebody lets you something, return it back to them in a better condition. A lot of y'all are amen in right now, but that needs to be a big amen because you would expect people to do the same for you. So I borrowed my dad's Sportage. And I had some other people helping us move some stuff, and they weren't really paying attention. And they threw this metal fixture in my dad's brand new car and scratched it all up. I was like, what are y'all doing? They scratched it all up. But in this moment, I was an adult. <laughs> in this moment, I felt shame. And I was like, man, I don't want to take this back to my dad. Like, I literally just scratched up his brand new car. And he was pumped about this car, detailed it, you know, hand washing it, wiping it down. And I scratched it all up. And I remember calling him being like, Dad, please don't get upset. I'll pay for it. I'll do whatever it is. But I felt, I felt a whole bunch of shame in that moment. And shame can cause you to battle with your emotions. It can cause you to battle in your mind. Shame can cause you to feel and do a whole bunch of things that you wouldn't normally do. And so today, I really want to talk and come against shame. And so I'm going to talk to you guys about the effects of shame and the ways out of shame. And so the first one is that shame will cause us to avoid relationships, vulnerability, and community. 
But look, the way out is the opposite. The way out is to seek relationships, commit to vulnerability. Notice it says with safe people. Don't just be telling everybody everything. Everybody doesn't need to know your business. Be vulnerable with safe people who will speak good things and godly things into your life. And then it says do everything in your power to find community. When I was doing my study on shame, this wasn't even on a Christian website, and I think it's interesting how it says do everything in your power to find community to get out of shame. Isn't that interesting? Because God created us for community. We weren't created to do life alone, and so in order to get out of shame, you have to find community. And there's two different responses when shame hits that I kind of want to talk to you about today. One is when you feel shame, it can either drive you away or when you feel shame, it can draw you in closer. And so I want to give you biblical examples today. And so the first biblical example is Judas. I feel bad for Judas, man. Every time somebody says Judas in church, I feel like people go, Ugh, not that guy. Judas was one of the disciples, and you know that Judas ended up betraying Jesus. But Judas was with them for all the miracles. He was a part of the, you know, gang gang, you know what I'm saying, all the disciples hanging with Jesus. Like, he was a part of all of that. But then he got greedy, and for 30 pieces of silver, he decided to turn Jesus over, turn him in to be arrested. And so Jesus ends up getting arrested, and you guys know the rest of the story. He ends up getting condemned. He dies on the cross for our sins. That's where you say Amen. And so um, when this happens, we pick up in Matthew 27, 3 through 5. And it says, then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. You see the shame he feels here? And... Um, they said, what is it to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. And I know that's a lot to take in, but I want to point some things out here. Judas was isolated. Judas felt shame and then he went off by himself and he hung himself. When you're by yourself, shame will cause you to feel depressed it will cause you to feel anxiety. It will cause you to feel like you are worthless. And we see here with Judas, it even caused suicidal thoughts. And I want to park here for a minute today because I know that depression, anxiety, feelings of worthlessness, and suicidal thoughts are very real things that people battle today. And so if you're in this room or you're watching online, I want you to know so much that we love you. And that we're willing to pray with you. But I also want you to know there's tons of resources out there today that there didn't used to be. There's hotlines. You can call somebody and let them know what's going on in your life. But most importantly, I want you to know this, that God is not done with you. That God still has a plan for your life. He has still called you. That even if you don't think you matter to anybody else, you matter to God. And I want you to know that you are not worthless, you are worth it to him. And he's not done with you. I want to share this with you in a story in the Bible. It's one of my favorite characters. This is found in 1 Kings 19, but I'm going to paraphrase it for you guys. And so this is Elijah. He's one of the prophets, and Elijah gets done doing this incredible miracle. This is like one of my favorite miracles in the Bible. He literally calls down like a tornado of fire from heaven. You guys aren't excited about it. It's okay. He calls down this massive tornado of like fire from heaven. And I'm like, oh my gosh, how cool would that be? Like, God, send fire. And the heavens open, and it's just like, psh. And it says that he killed 800 prophets of Baal that day. I'm like, yo, this was that dude. But then Jezebel says, hey, because of what you've done, I'm going to kill you. And Elijah takes off running. And I'm like, bro, what are you doing? You just called fire down from heaven and you're scared of her? What are you doing? But we pick up this story in 1 Kings 19 and we find Elijah alone in a cave. And I'm like, bro, what are you doing there? This is the JDB version today, by the way, the Joshua Douglas Baker version. So I'm going to tell it like that. Elijah's alone in this cave, alone with his thoughts. And he literally says, I want to die. Lord, take me. 
And this really hit me because I wonder how many of you understand that the enemy wants you alone in your thoughts. He wants you to feel hopeless. He wants you to feel worthless. He wants you to feel like you're done and there's nothing meaningful you could do in your life. And that's where Elijah was at this point. He's like, I've got nothing left. And so God shows up and he goes, Elijah, what are you doing here? And I love the woe is me story from Elijah. I'm the only one left, God. I'm the only one who loves you. I'm the only one who's serving you. And God goes, what? There's 7,000 other people who still love me. There's 7,000 other people who still haven't bowed their knee to Baal. And so I feel like the enemy wants you to feel like you're the only one. But there's other people who have been through what you've been through. There's other people who understand and there's people who can help you. But God says to Elijah, get up, get out of this cave and go back. I'm not done with you. I feel like that's what God's saying to you today. Get up, get out of the cave, and go back. And so when Elijah gets up out of the cave and he goes, he meets Elisha. And he mentors Elisha. And then Elisha ends up doing the double miracles of what Elijah did. What if Elijah would have stayed in that cave? Double the miracles wouldn't have happened. And so I wonder why the enemy's trying to keep you in a cave. What is he trying to keep you from doing that God is going to do in your life? And so I'm telling you today, God is saying, get out of the cave. I still have more for you. You're not alone, and he's going to do something through you. But the key in both of these stories is that Elijah and Judas were both isolated. They were both by themselves. They weren't around people to be able to encourage them. And so I'm going to give you the good example. Here comes Peter. Y'all love Peter? I love Peter. Peter was the disciple that ran his mouth when he was not supposed to. Peter was the disciple that stepped out right in front of Jesus. And Jesus is like, bro, what are you doing? I wonder if Jesus was ever just like, Peter, shut up. Stop talking. Why are you talking? But I love Peter because he had this bold faith. And he wasn't ashamed. And he was like, man, I'm, we're going to go. But so Peter is sitting at the Last Supper with Jesus. And Jesus is like, I'm telling you tonight that one of you is going to betray me. And here goes Peter running his mouth before anybody else has a chance to say anything. He's like, I'll never betray you, God. I'll never betray you, Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and goes, yeah, you will. Three times before the rooster crows, you'll deny me. And I'm like, man, I wonder how Peter felt in that moment. And so the story progresses. Jesus gets arrested and Peter's walking around and somebody comes up to him and they're like, hey, aren't you, aren't you one of the disciples? And he was like, no, that's not me. You must have me confused with somebody else. And they were like, no, 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 man. Another person comes up and is like, no, I, I saw you with Jesus. Like, I know you were with him. I know you were with the other disciples. And he was like, that wasn't me. You must have me confused with somebody else. I don't even know that man. Somebody else comes up and is like, no, 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 I'm telling you. I know I'm not mistaken. It was you. I saw you right next to Jesus. And then he curses, cusses for modern day terminology, and says, I don't know that man. And then the rooster crows. This really hits me because I try to like place myself in Peter's shoes in that moment. I wonder what he felt like when that rooster crowed and realized that he had denied the Savior of the world. I can't imagine the amount of shame he felt. I can't imagine the weight of feeling like he betrayed Jesus, somebody that he loved, somebody who was a friend to him. I can't imagine what he felt. But you know what? Peter was smart. Look what Peter does. John 21, verses 1 through 2. And after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, 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 I don't know which one it is, I like Zebedee better, and two others of his disciples were together. Peter was in community. Peter was surrounded by people who loved him. He was surrounded by people who believed the same things that he did. And this is so important. Again, this is why I wish we had like the Bible backstory. Because I wonder if Peter was sitting on the shore with his head slumped and his shoulders slumped. And I wonder if he looks at the other disciples and goes, man, remember when we were having the Last Supper together and Jesus said I was going to deny him? I did it. I denied him all three times. I feel useless. I feel worthless. I feel like God could never use me now. 
And you know what? I wonder what the other disciples said back. Because John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, I love how John describes himself, was there. And I wonder if John goes, Peter, why are you hanging your head? You were the first of us that Jesus revealed that he was the Christ to. You were the first one to say out loud that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter, you were the one that had the faith to get out of the boat and walk on the water. Peter, you've been the most faithful out of all of us. Are you kidding me? Don't hang your head. And I bet you if Jesus was here right now, he wouldn't look at you and be ashamed of you. He would say, Peter, it's okay. I still love you. Stop hanging your head, man. Get back on your feet. Let's go. God still has something for you. This is why community is so important. Have you ever been alone with your own thoughts? They're crazy. Sometimes I get off stage and I'm like, that sermon was terrible. And somebody's like, it was really not that bad. It was terrible. But if I'm alone with my thoughts, I'm beating myself up. But when you are in community and you confess it to somebody, they have an opportunity to speak into you and be like, eh, it's not as bad as you're saying. It's not as bad as you're thinking. Hey, I know what you're going through in your life, but I've been through this too. Let me tell you what it did for me. Let me tell you how God helped me. Peter was in community, and so he set himself up to get a way out of shame. And so I want the same for you guys. The way to set yourself up to get out of shame is to be in community, is to be surrounded by people who can speak positive things into your life. Set yourself up to have a way out of shame. Number two, shame will cause you to fear rejection, care about being devalued by others, and care about their opinions. The way out is to remember that it's only God's opinion of you that matters. I feel like this is a big one in our world today. Why? Because of social media. Have you ever felt like you wanted to share something and then you started thinking about other people's opinions and you didn't share it? Okay, I'll give you the practical side. You thought about posting this picture, but it didn't match the aesthetic of your page and somebody's going to be like, mm, that picture's out of place and so you didn't post it. Or it was a black and white photo, and you were like, mm, the rest of my page is in color, and that's going to mess up with my page. The black and white photo is kind of dingy, so I'm not going to post it. You ever looked at your outfit and then gone, mm, nope, I'm going to go change this outfit because I care about what people think. We care about people's opinions in the world we live in today. So much so it affects what we say. I think this is why sometimes people are afraid to share the gospel. Because you're afraid to be devalued by someone else. Or you're afraid that their opinion of you is going to change the way people view you. And so Pastor Aaron and I were talking about this sermon together. And um, there's two comedians who are very well known. And they were saying today with social media, when you put content out, everybody has a negative thing to say. And so you just don't read the comments. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but I got to read the comments. I feel like Britney Spears. I know I'm not supposed to, but oops, I did it again. I read the comments. I can't help it because I see sports debates. Anybody watching online, if you think Aaron Rodgers is better than Tom Brady, you're crazy. I see these sports debates, and, you know, they got like 13,000 comments. And I'm like, view three more replies, view three more replies, view three more replies. I'm viewing all of them because I want to know what they have to say. I see some crazy negative ones. But this really made me think about this comment I saw one time. I was on a church's page, and I saw somebody post, do people still really believe in God? Like it was stupid to believe in God. Y'all ever been locked and loaded in the comment section? I wanted to reply back so bad, but I didn't. I just prayed for them. I'm working on it. But let me tell you what I was going to say. <laughs> in my head, I'm like, I can't answer if other people believe in God, but I can tell you that I still believe in God. Here's why. I've encountered God in my life. When I was 16 years old, I broke my leg. I went to eight MRIs. The doctor said, we've done everything we can. We don't know how to fix your leg. My mom said, cool, I'm tired of this. We come home in the living room. She cuts my cast off, anoints my leg with oil, prays over it. God shows up in my living room. We go back to the doctor's office for the ninth MRI, and they say, hey, I don't how to explain this but all your ligaments are back together your bones healed and you can walk out of here 
There was another time that I was 22 years old. I was in a medically induced coma on a hospital bed. They told my dad to go ahead and go back home. He's not going to wake up. But God showed up in my hospital room and said, it's time to be the Joshua I've called you to be. Get up. And I woke up out of my coma. We had a lady who called a month ago. We were on our 8 a.m. prayer call, and she stayed on after, and she said, Pastor Josh, can you pray for me? She said, I've got some swelling in my chest, and there's something going on, and they want to do x-rays to see if I'm going to have to have surgery. It might be breast cancer. She was like, can we pray together? And I said, absolutely, we can pray together. Last Monday, she called and she said, hey, all the swelling in my chest went down. And they said, I don't have to have surgery because God healed me in Jesus' name. So do I still believe in God? Absolutely, because God is still healing. God is still saving. God is powerful. And there is nothing that is too impossible for God. Instagram comments get me fired up. And then I saw one that was a little bit more personal. I've never, ever been attacked on social media before. I feel like I'm a pretty likable person. I'm funny, you know, sometimes. And uh, I just, you know, people just genuinely like me. And I'm like, cool, I've never been attacked before until we posted a video for the church page. And it was me and Brittany, and we're having fun on the video. And there was a whole bunch of comments that were like, oh, my gosh, Josh and Brittany, we love you guys. Thank you. I love you, too. But then I found some negative comments. And this one was like, Who could ever take this guy seriously? And I was like, dang, maybe maybe I'm too goofy. Maybe I need to be, I don't know, maybe I need to be more serious. Maybe that makes me look more mature. Maybe I should have done the video a different way. Maybe we shouldn't have posted the video. It got me thinking all these negative things about something that we put out for the public to see. But then a couple Sundays ago, this lady comes up to me, and she goes, you're the guy. You're the guy from Instagram. I was like, <laughs> that's so cool. I've never been the guy from Instagram before. Just telling y'all how real it is. You know, it was cool. She was like, you're the guy from Instagram. She was like, I saw the church's ad, and I came to church, and last week I rededicated my life to God. And I was like, man, it just hit me in that moment that it's so much more about God's opinion. It's so much more about what God is doing in and through you than when other people think of you. And so I want to share these with you today. I looked up what the Bible says about opinions. Are y'all ready for this? The Bible is locked and loaded when it comes to opinions. Proverbs 18.2 says, A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinions. That's why it's no reason for you to debate people on social media. They are literally just there to state their opinion. They don't care about understanding anything that you believe. They just want to state an opinion. Opinion. And the Bible says not to argue with a fool, so read between the lines. Luke 10, 16 says, the one who hears you hears me. The one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. I feel like sometimes we're afraid to share our faith because we don't want to reject, be rejected by people. But I got news for you. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting God. It has nothing to do with you. In sales, they used to teach us to expect no. So when you get told no, it wouldn't discourage you. But when you make that sale, it's like, yes, let's go. I wonder if our faith, sharing our faith, should be the same way. Expect rejection, not in a negative way, so that if you do get rejected, it doesn't discourage you. But then think about that one time that you share and somebody's like, man, I've been praying that God would send somebody to talk to me. I'm so glad you talked to me. Man, I was praying for somebody to invite me to church. Actually, I've been looking for a church. You got to be encouraged by that time that God uses you to speak into somebody's life when you share the gospel with them. John, where am I at? John 12, 42 through 43 says this, Nevertheless, many of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Whose glory are we living for these days? Are we living more for the glory that comes from man and their opinions, or are we living more for the glory that comes from God? This last scripture really got me. Luke 9, 26. It says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of his holy angels. Whoa. So if I'm ashamed of Jesus here, he'll be ashamed of me up there? If I say, nah, I don't know Jesus, when I get up to heaven and God's standing there, God's like, do you know him? Jesus is like, no, nah, I don't know him. I want to be the type of person that's unashamed of Jesus here so that Jesus is unashamed of me in heaven. And when I get to heaven, God is like, who is that? Jesus is like, oh, it's just Josh. 
Yeah, come on, Josh. Yeah, good job, man. Man, you did so good. Yeah, you good and faithful servant. Come on, man. Yeah, I'm not ashamed of him because he was obedient to us, and he cared about our opinions, not opinions of other people. And so, yeah, we can let him in. It's cool. I hope that that's your plan for your life. I hope that you feel the same way, that you want to be unashamed of Jesus here so he's unashamed of you there. At the end of the day, I want to do what's pleasing to God. I want to be obedient to him and everything that he's called me to do because really at the end of the day and for all eternity, it's really only his opinion that matters. The last thing I want to talk to you about today is this. <clears throat> Shame will cause you to fall back into old habits or old lifestyles. The way out is to believe that God has made you for more and called you to a higher purpose. Um, so I told you this Peter of story. Or this Peter of story? <laughs> Y'all got to help me today. This story of Peter. And he was with the other disciples. And um, we're going to pick up in John 3, but I'm just going to paraphrase it for you. Peter went back to fishing. And I don't know if you know the original story, but Jesus came and, and met Peter and he said, come on, you're no longer going to be a fisherman, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And he called him. But when Jesus got crucified and Peter was ashamed, he went back to doing the thing that God called him away from. He went back to fishing because it was comfortable, it was what he was used to. And I've seen this so many times with people in their relationship with God. Maybe you do something, maybe you sin, maybe you have something you're ashamed of. Maybe there's something in your life that you don't feel like you can come to church because of. And so what, what we do is we step back into old habits. We step back into old lifestyles and slowly start to step away from what God has for us. And this is a time when we, should feel sh when we feel shame that we should go to God. And so I want to show you Peter's response. They're in the boat and they're out fishing. And Jesus is standing on the shore. And he's like, hey, have you caught anything? And they're like, no, we haven't caught anything. And at first, they didn't recognize that it was Jesus. And he says, cast your net to the other side. And they cast their net to the other side and catch a whole bunch of stuff. That's how Jesus called them the first time. And so immediately, they realized it was Jesus. And John's like, Peter, it's Jesus. Look at Peter's response. Peter literally throws his cloak on, jumps overboard, and swims to shore to meet Jesus. That, to me, shows us today how we're supposed to respond when we feel shame. Peter didn't run from Jesus, he ran to Jesus. Because I want you to know this, that when you run to Jesus with your shame, when you run to God with your shame, God doesn't want to expose it. Jesus, when Peter came to him, he didn't go, told you, dummy. I told you you were going to deny me three times. That's not what happened. We pick up here in John 21, verses 15 through 19. Look what Jesus does. Peter comes to shore and Jesus sits with Peter. And he says, hey, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, then feed my sheep. He said, Peter, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, then feed my lambs. He said, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yes, God, you know that I love you. He said, then feed my sheep. Look what Jesus did. For the three times that Peter denied him, he reaffirmed him three times. And then at the end of this passage, he says, follow me, which is the same thing he told him the first time. What does this mean? That the shame, the wrong that Peter had done, it didn't matter. When he went back to Jesus, Jesus set him right back up in the place that he had left him, set him right back up in the place that he had called him to, and reminded him, I didn't call you to be a fisherman anymore. I called you to be a fisher of men. I called you out of your old lifestyle, out of your past, into the lifestyle and the future that I have for you. Jesus set him up right back where he was. And after this encounter with Jesus, Peter has this boldness. Peter is changed and unashamed. How do we know this? Because in Acts, Peter's the one who preaches on the day of Pentecost. He also was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a major key. When you get filled with the Holy Spirit, power will come upon you to be witnesses in our nation, witnesses in our land. And so he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he's got this boldness. It even says several times, he's like, I say confidently that this is Jesus. This is the Savior of the world. He went from someone who denied Jesus to someone who was proclaiming him. He was bold, changed, and unashamed. And so the last thing I want to talk to you about is being changed and unashamed. I used to think that being changed and unashamed meant that I had to be strong, that I had to be confident in myself, that I had to be confident in my abilities. That's what the world tells us, right? Be confidently you. Be you. Be confident in yourself. But that's so wrong. Being unashamed is not being confident in myself. It's being able to admit that I'm weak so God can look strong. It's being able to admit that I'm weak so God can be strong for me. It's being able to admit that I need a savior 
to be able to free me from the things that I've done. It's me admitting that I need God's power to be who it is that he's called me to be. One encounter with Jesus will leave you changed. I learned this from the lady at the well. She didn't care about being, you know, the lady with five husbands anymore. All she cared about was telling people about Jesus. Peter didn't care that he denied Jesus anymore. He cared that he was proclaiming Jesus, boldly, unashamedly proclaiming Jesus. And I think that's so important um, because it's not about who we are. It's about who he is. And I want to close with this story. Um, C.S. Lewis wrote this story, and I thought it was so good. There was a mother who had really burned, messed up, scarred hands, and her daughter was ashamed of them. Her daughter didn't want to be seen with her in public. If she was in public with her mom, she wanted her mom to wear gloves because her hands were scarred so badly. And she got to an age where she was old enough and she asked her mom, she said, what did your scars on your hands come from? And she said, when you were a baby, you fell into a fire and I pulled you from the fire with my hands. My hands are scarred and burned from saving your life. It changed that daughter's perspective. All of a sudden, those hands were the most beautiful hands in the world to her. All of a sudden, she told her mom, stop, stop wearing the gloves. Because when we're out in public and people ask about your hands, I'm going to say, hey, my mom saved my life with those hands. Those hands are beautiful. I wonder if her mom ever got to a place where she was like, hey, are you ashamed of me? Because I feel like that's what God's asking us today. Are you ashamed of me? Why? Because Jesus has scars on his hands. He's got scars on his feet, and he's got a scar on his side. And the reason he has those scars is because he went to the cross for us. He has those scars from saving our life. And I think when we really truly understand that and understand the good news of the gospel, that Jesus died so that we could be saved, we should change just like the daughter did. Hey, let me tell you about Jesus' scars. Hey, let me tell you about the person who saved my life. Hey, let me tell you about a Savior who changed my life, and he can do the same thing for you. I want you to know today that Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, because it is the power of God that brings salvation. Anytime you share the gospel, it releases the power of God and gives someone else an opportunity for their life to be changed and for them to be saved and be in the family of God. Nothing is more important than the message of the gospel. But I want you to know today, if you're in this place um, and you feel like you can't really share because you have shame in your life, the enemy wants you to stay there. But I want you to know that God has a plan and a purpose for you today. And he wants to have an encounter with you so that he can cause you to be bold, to be changed, and to be unashamed. And so let's bow our heads and pray together. If you're in this place today and you've never said the prayer of salvation, that's really the first step to being changed and unashamed. It's about having a personal relationship with Jesus. And so I want you to know this today, that God is not ashamed of your sin. He's not ashamed of your past. He's not ashamed of of what you've done. Matter of fact, the Bible says that God loves and covers sin, that he covers your shame. He doesn't want to expose it. And so if you're in here and you've never had a relationship with God and you want to be saved today, I want you to know that God loves you. He loves you so much. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. He sent his only son, Jesus, to die for your sins and pay a debt on the cross that we never could. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. And all you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth and say a simple prayer. And so I also want you to know that the enemy is probably making you feel Um, like because of your shame or because of your past that God could never use you. And I want to silence that lie right now because God will take your shame away and he'll give you a new purpose and a new plan for your life. And so if that's you in here today, you want to be saved, I just want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, don't let the enemy take this moment from you. Two, God loves you and has a plan for your life. And three, you want to be saved today. Raise your hand all over this room right now. I see hands going up. I see your hand. 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 Hands going up all over this room. Come on, guys. Don't let the enemy take this moment from you. I feel like somebody is in a battle right now, and the enemy is just telling you all about your past and all about your shame, but God has so much for you. If this is your day-to-day to be saved, if that's you, just raise your hand. I feel like there's one more person. There it is right there. I see your hand. Come on. Thank you, God. 
So we're going to pray a simple prayer together and everybody pray together because nobody prays alone. Say, dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart today. Forgive me of my sins. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for saving me. I thank you that I'm changed and I pray that you help me to be bold and unashamed. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey guys, if you said that prayer today, I want you to know the Bible says that all of heaven rejoices over one salvation. And there was a whole bunch in this room, so there's a party going on in heaven. So y'all put your hands together. Welcome to the family of God today. Anybody, can I have a connection card real quick? Does anybody have a connection card? Give me a connection card. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So do me one more favor. We just believe here at Alive Church in taking next steps. And so if you said the prayer of salvation today, I want you to fill out this card and just check off the place where it says, I have accepted Christ. We just want an opportunity to be able to walk with you through this journey and kind of help you take your next steps. And then if you're here today and you're like, hey man, I love this church. Um, I have questions about it and, and I just want to know more about it. We have growth track step one happening today. Or if you're here and you know, you're like, you guys have so much fun. I just want to be a part. I want to be on the team. I want to be a part of what you guys do. Go to growth track today. It's happening right after service. Love you guys. I hope today's word was encouraging for you and I will see you again soon. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to Alive Online today. I pray that message was a blessing to you. I pray that the Holy Spirit just takes something from it. And he illuminates it to where your life will never be the same again. If that's the case, make sure you let us know how your life was impacted and changed because of the message on today. We would love for you to share this content. You know, we have a saying in Alive Church that one invite can change a life. We also believe that one share can change a life. I mean, get your share on. God will use your share as a lifeline to reach people around the world. All right, if you like what we're doing here, we would love for you to be a part of our online family. You can do that by hitting subscribe. We want you to be the first to grab hold of all new messages and all new content as they are released. You know, the Bible says that when we give, It'll be given back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And one of the greatest ways that you can make a difference and change lives is by giving. And so if you would like to sow to the ministry of Alive Church, hit the button below. And I know that God will bless you, and you'll also be a blessing to other people. We love you, and we'll see you real soon. God bless you.